when the world of true crime and conspiracy combine together, you have a possible civil war. And then we take a look at the story of a young man who's at a crossroads in his life. He does not remember summoning dark entities into his life. Is it possible that you as well may have made a deal with the devil and you don't even know it? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys have some awesome plans for the weekend. We got a ton of stuff to cover today. So first off, returning into Dead Rabbit Command from yesterday's episode. He didn't get a chance to fly the Carpenter Copter, and i like all you guys to do it. Walking into Dead Rabbit Command right now, everyone give a round of applause for our Patreon supporter, Jet Engine XD. Woohoo, yeah, wee hee, <laughs> Yeah! Come on in. Jet Engine, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, I totally understand. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so much. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know. Dead Rabbit Radio is your favorite paranormal show. Jet Engine, I'm going to go ahead and get this party started by tossing you the oars to the Dead Rabbit rowboat. We're leaving behind Dead Rabbit Command. Row, row, row us all the way out to Haiti. Oh, splash. Oh, splash. Rowan, this long way. I don't, actually don't know how far away Haiti is. We're headed out to the nation of Haiti. And what is going on? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before we get started, I got to give a shout out. People are like, what's this bizarre art? What's this thing we're looking at? What? You're just going to gloss over this? Fan Art Friday. Fan Art Friday. We got a submission from McKinley. McKinley sent it over to me, and I clicked it, and I go, oh, what a cute, cute rabbit. And then I noticed the maggots burrowing through its rotting flesh. I mean, it's taking dead rabbit, quite literally, but I love it. If you're you're watching this on YouTube, you might want to click to another tab. I don't know if you want to stare at this artwork the whole time, but it is, it's great. Um, it's, It's probably the first fan art that's involved maggots actively eating a rabbit. But McKinley, thank you so much for sending it over. I do love it. Really, really appreciate the submission for Fan Art Friday. Okay, we're rowing in the boat. Splishity splash, splishity splash. Headed all the way out to Haiti. Now, I'm not going to say that I'm a huge geopolitical expert just in general, especially as far as Haiti goes. I've obviously picked up stuff through osmosis, through reading the newspaper for decades. A lot of corruption. A lot of instability, not just politically, but there's a lot of earthquakes that happen there. It doesn't seem like the ideal paradise that it could be if you had a functioning government and less earthquakes. Or at least, you know, buildings that could survive earthquakes, which would involve infrastructure, which would involve a less corrupt government. Haiti does pop up a lot because, so whenever they have an earthquake, obviously you're going to have a lot of humanitarian groups in the country. That's something that is great about humanity is we very often come together in times like this. But what I've seen in the conspiracy theory community over the years is some of this stuff has been validated. Some of the stuff is just rumors, but you do get child traffickers. This is despicable, right? This is absolutely despicable. You get child traffickers going to countries like Haiti, in this case specifically Haiti, after these natural disasters, and they pose as workers. They pose as like, you know, workers to help with the cleanup, workers to help with the family, stuff like that. And they traffic the children out of the country. That's been a long-standing conspiracy, quote-unquote conspiracy, because I'm sure a couple, I think, if I remember correctly, I'll find articles if I can. People have gotten arrested for this. They go there, they travel the children out. And whether or not they're doing it under the guise of emergency work after an earthquake, Haiti does have a big child trafficking problem. Moving them out of the country to other places in the world, either for domestic slavery or sex slavery. So it's a country that could definitely be better. Hot spot for child trafficking, corruption, and and really where you get both of these things kind of combining is the gangs in Haiti. 
The gangs in Haiti are pretty much operating unopposed at this point. The capital of Haiti is Port-au-Prince. And that city, the capital city, imagine the capital city of your country. You might be listening to this in Haiti, but imagine if the capital city of your country, 80% of it was controlled by gangs. That's not hypothetical. (laughs) It's not hypothetical for the people of Haiti. So they, for, you know, really all intents and purposes, control the government. Everyone's bought off or they're too scared to do anything. You have all of these gangs roving the country, fighting against each other, preying on the populace. There's just been reports of random rapes, random murders, people getting gunned down in the street by these gangsters. Everyone knows someone who's gotten killed by a gang member. And a a lot of people have just seen total strangers get gunned down in the middle of the street. In the month of April... Don't worry, this, this, you're like, Jason, wow, this is real bleak, don't worry. There's a silver lining of this, and it's insane. In the month of April 2023, in the city of Port-au-Prince, 146 people were murdered by gangs. 146 people were killed by gang members in the month of April. And really, the first three weeks of April, 146 people killed. But eventually, you can only push a society so far. It's interesting to see. Some societies can take it a little more than others, but you can only push it so far. In the first three weeks of April, 146 gangland murders. So what happened on that fourth week of April? Well, a new group has arisen in the city of Port-au-Prince. An army of vigilantes who call themselves Bois Kale, Bois Kale, has decided to take the war to the gangsters. Now, the gangsters have the power, they have the money, which they use to bribe politicians, bribe police officers. They can have stuff imported into the country. They're heavily armed. The people of Port-au-Prince, they're not. They don't have access to all these machine guns and things like that. What they have access to, though, is literally anything sharp. And that's what Bois Kale kind of has a double meaning. It means to strip the bark off of a stick. So on the one hand, it means pick up anything you got, make it sharp, and just start stabbing gangsters. You see a gang member? Stab him in the throat. Bois Kale also means you know, carve the bark off the stick. They go, that's what we're going to do to these gangsters. We're going to slice them up and have a true and free Haiti. This is nuts, dude. Gangsters are just getting brutally murdered in the streets. And this is completely different than anything they've seen in this country before. That fourth week of April is when they really started to see this pop off. There's this guy, they think that this is the leader of the group, because it's super recent, right? We're in June right now. His name is Nertil Marcellin. There's an article I read in The Sun. This man, his name is Nertil Marcellin. There's photographs, this article, I'll have it in the show notes, obviously, but they have all these photographs. He's just walking down the street, handing out brand new machetes. Like, the plastic is still on the machete. He's just handing them out to people. He's handing them out to anyone who's willing to fight, which at this point is most people. Take back this city. We have to fight back. We're just going to die otherwise. There's no other way to fix this because the government's not going to fix it. And the UN, who's constantly talking about building communities and world peace and stabilizing governments, they poke their head into Haiti every once in a while. But these gangs have run roughshod over the country for so long that the UN's just like, oh, well, you know, both sides, blah, 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 blah. And we'll get back to that in a second. Because now you have this army of vigilantes running through the streets, chopping up gang members. It really, like, the first big attack they had, apparently, was there was a police bus carrying 13 gangsters through the city. Now, I'm going to take a guess here. I'm going to guess they weren't arrested. I'm going to guess. They weren't on their way to jail. I think they had a police escort. I don't know that for sure, but 13 gangsters in a police bus going through town and Bois Kale... The people surrounded the bus, 
pulled the 13 gangsters off the bus, beat them up, lynched them, and then burned the bodies. This was like in the middle of the street. They're, they made no effort to hide this. In fact, they didn't want to hide it. They wanted everyone to know that this was done. Now you had this gang. You had this gang that was 13 members down. And so what happened was you had another group of Bois Hale troops storm that gang stronghold. It was a surprise attack, because who would, who would think this would happen, right? All of a sudden, a dude, you're just sitting at home, being a drug dealer, corrupting all of society, and a bunch of people running your house with machetes and sharp sticks. They were massacred. They were massacred. They ended up breaking into the stronghold and burning six of the gang members alive. It's machine guns versus machetes. It's just brutal killings in the street. And you have the citizens going, this is our only chance to take this back. And what's happened is, remember we said, the first three weeks of April, you had 146 gangland murders in Port-au-Prince. Now, I'm sure some of those were gang on gang, but a lot of those were gangs on innocent civilians, because that's been the big problem. First three weeks, 146 gang murders after Bois Kale steps in. In the whole month of May, 43 gangland murders. They're scared to leave their strongholds. They're scared to get caught by this vigilante group that's just walking down the street. There was a human rights group report that stated, quote, without making a value judgment, we'll get to that in a second, without making a value judgment, the Bois-Kale movement has in just one month produced convincing visible results. Fear has changed sides. Unquote. The gangsters are afraid of the populace now. And they're hiding in their strongholds. There's a ton of these gangs, right? It's not like just one or two gangs. There's a ton of these gangs in the city. And they're hiding in their strongholds because here's the thing. You can have a machine gun. But if 30 people are coming at you with machetes, you lose. You lose that battle. If the people who are coming at you with machetes go, listen, this guy may shoot me in the head and I may be the first to die, but I might die tomorrow anyways because this gang's out of control. Like, I've already seen my sister get shot in the middle of the street, broad daylight. So I will take my chance. There's 30 of us. We have machetes. We're going to chop you to pieces. We're going to set you on fire. They're very, very brutal murders. There have been groups of children walking around with sharpened sticks chanting out that they are also hunting the gang members. Society is on a tipping point. And this is what I find so infuriating about this. So you have vigilante, the the government's completely falling apart, and that's when vigilanteism has to start off. It just has to, because otherwise the gangs are going to control everything. Haiti is a mess. Haiti's been a mess for decades. Gangs have taken over. No one was doing anything. You'd get, you know, a humanitarian report issued by this NGO, non-governmental organization, or, you know, the UN or whatever, da 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 you send, in, you send in rescue workers, and some of them are leaving with their kids. Like, the people are like, we're done. This article says that now the United Nations is thinking of sending in troops. The United Nations is talking to other countries in the region being like, we want to put together an international force so we can go in and stop the violence. Really? Now? Now you want to stop the violence? You didn't care when people were getting shot in the street in broad daylight? People were getting raped and murdered on the regular so much so that it was impacting people's daily lives. They were in fear. Now you want to send in the blue helmets. Now you want to send in the troops to stop the violence. You didn't have a problem. You didn't have a problem when that drug money was flowing into that country and into your pockets. You didn't have a problem when these politicians were getting paid off. You didn't have a problem when fear was only on one side, the side of the populace. But now that fear has changed sides. Now that these people's pockets, their 
Bottom line, is it going to get affected? Because, listen, corruption goes all the way up. It always does. There are drugs coming into Haiti. There's money coming into Haiti. Child trafficking, just trafficking in general. Human trafficking, drug trafficking, all of this stuff. Now you want to send in the troops? Now that the people are actually standing up against these people. They're afraid that this vigilante war may descend the country into chaos. A civil war. I don't like war, right? I don't like people getting killed. I watch a bunch of war movies. I find action stuff really, really cool. But when people are just blowing each other up in the real world, it makes me sad. I don't like to see that. I don't I don't like to see that stuff. And I think most people don't. But I also understand the necessity for it. And when you live in a drug-controlled culture where the gangs are just slaughtering your citizens, your, not even your citizens, your brothers and sisters, your family members, or just your neighbor, the guy you would see walk down the street, and you, you watch his head get blown off with a sawed-off shotgun one day for no reason. Now the UN wants to get... And they would. This is what's so gross about this is that the UN will, because a lot, they'll be going to these leaders of these other countries and say, hey, we want to put together an international force. And that leader of that other country may also be getting paid off by these drug dealers. So, of course, he's going to put troops over there. And they're going to send these troops in, and it's going to be a one sided thing. They're going to work at disarming Bois Kale. They'll make little motions here and there about stopping the gangs. They'll show photos of gang members getting arrested and stuff like that. But they're going to focus all their time on disarming Bois Kale. They're also probably going to be trying to either get this guy who's the presumed leader, Nertil Marcel, and he may get arrested for trumped up charges. He could get assassinated. They could try to buy him off. But hopefully the people have spoken. Hopefully the gangsters realize that their reign of terror is over. But if the UN steps in, the vigilantes have no chance. Because then you have the whole power of the world government and the whole power of the media against them. Because even this article was interesting. They said, you know, people are afraid that innocent women could get killed during this conflict because if a woman is dating a gang member, then she is a target. So we got to be careful about this stuff. Super weird because women are already getting killed who aren't dating gang members. Just women are getting killed anyways, raped and murdered in Haiti. But this article goes, hey, you know, we, we got to be careful. This violence may spiral out of control. It's already out of control, man. It's so weird. And you're already starting to see that eyeball of the world looking on Haiti and saying, this isn't good. And it's funny because all the photos, everyone's smiling. <laughs> Everyone has a machete in their hand. They're smiling. Because they finally have a chance to fight back. But if the UN gets involved, then it's over. Again, I am, listen, I'm not for people getting slaughtered in the street. I would prefer that the gangs just go, you know what? This is getting too dicey for us and leave. And it's all settled peacefully. Fascinating story, fascinating story. And you do have that true crime, obviously, with this vigilante war. And the conspiracy theories, right? If powerful people are going into Haiti to help traffic kids, out of there, using these huge mechanisms, using these funnels to get kids from here to there and get them past customs and all this stuff, get them over the borders, not just of America, but every country in the world, then obviously they got a stake in it. They want to keep that kid trafficking business going. Jet engine, that's probably about as political as this podcast has ever gotten, honestly. Jet Engine, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys to the Carpenter Copter. We are leaving behind Haiti. Fly us all the way out to a house in the suburbs. <laughs> Speaking of true crime, I want to give a really quick Dead Rabbit Radio recommends. Now, I was able to appreciate this movie. I saw this movie. I knew nothing about it but its title. I didn't know anything about it when I put it in. Um, the first thing that popped up was the Criterion Collection logo. And I go, oh man, is this going to be some arty? <laughs> is this going to be some arty movie? I was hoping for, I, I thought it was in my horror catalog. I was like, what? Are and then it was black and white. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> oh no. But anyways, it was a movie called Following. 
And I finished watching it. It's only like an hour and 10 minutes long. It's super brisk. I finished watching it. And I find out afterwards, it's Christopher Nolan's first film. He shot it in college for $6,000. And um, you can classify it as a horror movie. It, you can classify it as a true crime movie. I loved it. I absolutely... I watched it two days in a row. I watched it by myself. I was playing Minecraft while I was watching it. Sorry, Chris. You probably don't like to hear that. I was playing Minecraft while I was watching it. And the next day, I was hanging out with Sabine, and I go, dude, we got to watch this movie. And I didn't tell her anything about it. It's just called Following. You just got to trust me on this. Very, very good movie. I mean, it's great. I, it's so good. I really like it. It's amazing. It was his first film, shot for $6,000. All of those things. The directing, obviously, is on point. You lose sense of when the movie takes place. They talk about CDs and cassettes a lot of the movie. I'm not going to tell you the plot. But they talk about, because that's something you just got to figure out. They talk a lot about CDs and cassettes in the movie, but the sets are so timeless that it feels like you're watching something from the 1940s, 1950s. I had no idea when it was made. Like, I wasn't even picking up on the fact they were talking about CDs. Um, I, at one point I looked over the movie and I go, when was this made? Was this like in the 1950s? It was made in like 1998. But I really recommend it. Like it's the first time I watched it, I was just listening to it playing Minecraft and it blew me away. And then the second time I actually had my eyeballs on the movie and I appreciate it. Obviously I appreciate it on a different level. I was like, wow, look at there's shadows in this scene. But there was stuff that I missed that even Sabine was like, oh yeah, I remember this. And I was like, no, I didn't even pick up on that. Very, very good movie. It's on the Criterion Collection. It should be available streaming most places. But I really recommend, if you're looking for a very tight, suspenseful film to watch this weekend, which maybe some do, they're like, you know, I don't have anxiety this weekend. I'll watch the movie Jason recommended. It's anxiety-inducing. It's very, very good. I'm recommending it for two reasons. One, it's a great thriller slash horror in a lot of ways true crime movie or crime movie and then uh, just if you're a fan of filmmaking very very great movie dead rabbit radio recommends following we're outside this suburban household and we see three people walk out of the house and get into a car we see a young man who we're going to call brad and then brad's dad and Brad's brother, they all get into the car, and they pull out of the uh, driveway. Brad, Dad, and Brad's brother are driving down the road, and they're just talking, having a casual conversation. And through the course of this conversation, just random stuff, right? Brad's brother goes, oh, yeah, I know, man, that's crazy. It's almost as crazy as that time you used to play with that Ouija board. Brad's like, what? What are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, you remember that Ouija board you had? Dad's like, I remember that Ouija board. That was nuts, dude. I remember we had to track that down and get rid of it. And Brad's like, what are you talking about? I've never used a Ouija board in my life. And the dad's like, yeah, Brad, you did. It was a couple of years ago. It was when you were 15. You don't remember that? And Brad's like, no. And he goes, yeah, when you were 15, you and a bunch of your friends... We're playing with that Ouija board at the house. It was causing all sorts of weird phenomenon, and it, we got rid of it. <laughs> it's like I have zero idea of what you're talking about. I've never played with a Ouija board in my life. And this is when he hears this story, a story that he has zero memory of. He goes, he was told, back when he was 15 years old, one of his friends brought it over to the house, and... You guys would play around with the Ouija board. And the friend would leave. He wouldn't take the Ouija board with him. So you would put it under your bed. And like, no big deal, right? <laughs> Just open the portal to the other side to communicate with spirits long past. Slide it under your bed. And you guys did this a couple times. And whatever. You, it's a party game, I guess you could say. But then... All that weird stuff started happening. We started just having like weird, creepy things happening around the house. And you remember, you don't remember this at all. And Brad's like, I have no idea. And you imagine how panicked you would get. Because obviously, first off, I think most of us have a healthy 
fear of the Ouija board. <laughs> Some of you might be able to actually pronounce it. I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced. But Ouija? Anyways, we have a healthy fear of the Ouija board. I've never used one. I have no inclination to use one. I try to just avoid them if <laughs> possible. If you ever want to trap me in my house, surround it. Surround the perimeter with Ouija boards. I was like, no, I'm stuck here forever. And that would be Brad. He's like, I would never, I would never even mess with the Ouija board. What are you saying that I had one? Not only did I have one, not only did I use one, but I kept it under my bed. That's absolutely insane. That's at the very least asking for some gnarly nightmares. And the dad's like, yeah, it wasn't just that. Like weird stuff was happening around the house. Sure. But Brad, one day you woke up and you had scratches down your back. You don't remember that? It's like, no. He's all checking his back real quick. Uh, you had scratches down your back. And at that point, we're like, we're going to get rid of this Ouija board. You just, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, at the very least, it's just a stupid party game that's underneath your bed. At the worst, you're scratched up. Something is scratching you in your sleep. It's not you. It's on your back. So we made you get rid of it. Now, this story terrifies Brad, and honestly, it terrifies me. Because if you think about it, what? and I asked him, this is one of the people that I reached out to, because I don't often do it, unless I really feel it's necessary. But this one, I was like, what age were you? How old were you? And he goes online, he goes by the name No Relationship 767. It's his only post at the time of recording this, so I'm thinking it's just a throwaway post. Because here's the thing, if this happened when he was six, if it happened when he was nine, that would be one thing, right? They're a kid, kids get into all sorts of crazy stuff. But he was 15 when this happened. He goes, yeah, I was 15 years old when I supposedly was playing with this Ouija board. He goes, I still have no idea what happened. I don't think that I did, but they're telling me I did, they're telling me it affected the household. Now, when they said weird stuff was happening, it wasn't, they didn't go into detail, at least, uh, Brad didn't give us any detail. It could have just been, you know, tilted picture frames or sound of footsteps coming down the hallway. I mean, scary stuff, right? But not like, you know, there's not like a portal to hell in your bathtub every time you go to take a shower. Fiery arms grab your ankles. But the scratch is on his back. Right? I mean, that's pretty alarming if you're hiding a Ouija board underneath your bed and then you wake up with scratches on your back it's probably a wise decision to get rid of it it's probably a wise decision not to use them in the first place and brad's like i i agree that you should never use them i agree that they're super spooky i've never used one but now he's being told that he had and this is really what's scary to me is that you can only defend yourself against known threats that's just the way of the world if everyone's running around your city with a knife, you can go, okay, I'm going to take some precautions to not get stabbed. First off, I'm probably going to move. Probably going to move. Get out of here. If you live in an area that has a lot of uh, drinking and driving, a lot of alcoholism in general, you can go, well, you know, it's probably... Like, this is something I do. I don't go out walking, or I never really go out driving after 2 a.m. Unless it's 100% necessary, because I know that's when a lot of drunk driving is. They've been kicked out of the bar. In California, the bar's closed at 2. I, I think it's the same thing here in Oregon. But between 2 and 3, you get a lot of drunk drivers. Depending on the locality, that's a time because they've left. They've drank until the bar shut down, and now they're driving down the road. So those are things that I can make decisions. I go, well, I'm going to make a decision not to be out that late so I don't get T-boned by a drunk driver. But if you don't know that you've messed around with a Ouija board, if you honestly believe you've never done it before in your life, and weird things start happening to you, you would have zero context for what could possibly be doing this. Now, the weird things are happening to them while he had the Ouija board, and that's why they got rid of it. So those two things could be correlated. But now Brett's completely forgotten about the Ouija board. So much so, not like he's like, oh yeah, I remember that. He doesn't remember it at all. He has no idea about this time period in his life. And at the age of 15, you're pretty, you should have a working memory. And what I find creepy is he doesn't know 
who he contacted using the board. He doesn't know if he made any sort of deals or promises with this thing. To me, the fact that he doesn't remember it tells me that whatever he was doing was successful. Because again, if I was some demonic entity and someone summoned me into their 15-year-old bedroom and I was able to convince them to sell me their soul or to pledge something to me, one of the first things I would do, and I never even thought about this before, I never thought about this before, one of the first things I would do as a demon would be to erase his memory. Because now he can't fight back against it. If you remembered selling your soul at 15, even if you were just doing it as a joke, but you thought that you had contacted something real, you could go, um, that wasn't a good decision. I'm going to go speak to a spiritual leader about how to rectify this. But if you don't know that, if you don't know you even did that, he could go on through life, right? Now he has a kind of remembers that this happened, but he doesn't remember exactly, like I said, who he contacted or what, if any, type of deal or promise he made. So imagine Brad goes through his life and everything's going good. And he ends up getting married, having a kid, life seems great. And then all of a sudden, piece by piece, it falls away from him. He's watching horrific things happen to the people he loves the most. And in a way, he's chalking it up to chance, to bad luck, which would be the case for most of us. But what if he made some sort of deal, like this creature would get his soul, or this creature would give him seven years of happiness? Or whatever dumb thing kids come up with. The soul of your firstborn. Well, that, that's totally fine. It's soul of my firstborn for... Material success, I'm just not going to have kids. And then your brain gets erased. And you get the material success, you get their end of the bargain. You have no memory of promising, even in jest, the soul of your firstborn. So when your first child is born and you're holding that little baby in your hands for the first time and you're looking at that tiny face staring up at you, you have no idea that you've damned that child to an eternity of misery. It's terrifying, honestly. I've never thought of this before. And it's actually incredibly smart to do. If you are a demon, the best thing to do... Because you know humans are constantly... that That's kind of the immortal struggle no pun intended but you know the idea that you can trick a demon you can ask for something and say i want i want to be rich and famous and the demon goes you can do that i'll give you this thing until you turn 27 and then your soul is mine and the kid's like done totally fine with it because in the back of your head we're like well you know when i'm 20 i know i'm gonna at least live to be 27 when i'm 26 i'll go i'll go to the local church Get baptized. Ha ha ha, demon, I fooled you. And you don't remember that, though. You don't remember that. You go about your life, you end up getting that recording contract. You tried so hard getting this band off the ground, and then out of the blue, this guy says that he discovered you on YouTube, some video of you performing at a show or whatever, and now you're actually in the biz. You're cutting albums. You're huge. You're an international superstar. It's everything that you wanted it to be. And then you die at 27. It's tragic. Nobody saw it coming. Not even you. Even though you were the one who made the deal. You knew you were going to die at the age of 27. You had that out. You were going to get baptized. You knew what you needed to do, but you didn't know you needed to do it. You forgot. That's insane. That's so creepy. That is, I read this and I was like, wow, if, if this story is true, right? This changes things. This changes things. It's possible that I've, I always say I've never used a Ouija board. Never would use a Ouija board. Have I? <laughs> Have I? I don't know. I don't think so. Here's the thing. You could get into real, <laughs> you right now, you're like, ah, I'm freaking out. 
<laughs> you're destroying any flat piece of wood in your house. You're like, oh no, this might have once been a Ouija board. You could obviously take this to the most paranoid extreme, <laughs> destroying your house. I'm not asking you to do that, definitely. I'm just saying that it's so creepy because our memories, that they make us who we are. But if you can get tricked like this, like you're in a real desperate time in your life and you stand out on the street corner and you go, I would do anything to get everything back. I would do anything to be on top. I would sell my soul to have what I really want and it works and a demon shows up and you make an agreement with it and it leaves and then you forget. <laughs> I mean, that's just so, no pun intended on this one, diabolical. Because only an idiot would make a deal without an out clause. Only an idiot would go, yeah, no, I'm going to agree with everything you say and not try to figure a way out because you're selling your soul for eternity. Right? I mean, that's the most egregious example. That's like the worst thing that could happen. It could just be like, you're going to do this and then when you turn 30, you're going to murder your wife. You're going to sacrifice your wife for continued success. And you're not married at 15. You're like, sure, perfect. I'm never going to get married. And then you get what you want and a woman comes into your life. She's perfect for you. Everything's going great. And then you turn 30 and you either find yourself dying a horrific death and your soul burning forever in hell. And you're like, how did I get here? And the demon's like, you didn't fulfill your plan. I probably shouldn't have erased your memory in this example. Hell's full of all these people. They're like, ah, oh, why am I here? Why am I here? It's like, uh, the plan, the agreement. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. It burns, it burns. But imagine you found yourself at age 30 and you have everything you want in life, including a beautiful wife. And then one night a demon shows up and he's like, you got to kill her tonight. You're like, what are you talking about? And the demon goes and lays it all out. It completely blindsides you. And he says... If you don't kill her tonight, everything you have is going to be taken from you tomorrow, including her. You'll have nothing in the next 24 hours if you don't kill her tonight. And now you remember. Now you remember that deal you made so foolishly as a child. But you weren't able to prepare for it. Obviously, you would just choose not to marry if you remembered the deal. But now you find yourself standing in your kitchen. And there's a demon looking down at you and saying, you have to do this. You agreed to it. If you don't kill her tonight, you lose her and everything else anyways. You can't defend yourself against the threat you don't know exists in the first place. And you definitely can't weasel out of a contract you don't even remember signing. I think most people who make these deals with the devil or make deals with these demonic entities, whatever they are, Think that they're smarter than these dark creatures. And you know what? To be honest, maybe you are. Maybe you're not necessarily smarter. These things have been around since the beginning of time. But maybe you have figured an out. Maybe you have looked at a specific way to get out of the particular thing that you have to do to hold up your end of the bargain. Maybe you have figured out 100% a foolproof way to summon a demon and get everything you want with nothing in return. Maybe you have figured it all out. But none of that matters if you don't even remember making the deal in the first place. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. TikTok is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend, guys.